inviting me here. Um, I thought for a while about why I'm here, and I think part of the reason is that there's a big elephant in the room in these discussions, and that's the, the commercial uh, legal information industry. And I think I'm here to tell you how big the elephant is, and maybe a little bit about where it's moving, uh, and some of the some of the directions it might take in in light of all of the uh, the uh, open access stuff that we're talking about. Um, Carl uh, mentioned that uh, uh, Outsell, the company I work for, is the um, Gartner of the legal industry, legal information industry, but actually we're the Gartner of the whole information industry, not just legal. And that's a big part of what we do and a, and a big part of um, uh, what we can kind of bring to this discussion is, it, is the uh, understanding that we've learned from studying other segments of the information industry, such as scientific and medical and technical publishing, or the news industry, or uh, market research industry, or all of the, the several um, sectors of the industry that we track. Uh, we're a research and analysis company that, that serves that industry. Um, we collect data about publishers uh, uh, and their markets. Uh, we serve people in those companies, but we also serve, we have clients among uh, big content buyers, such as libraries, uh, corporate libraries, and uh, also academic and public libraries as well. Um, we collect a lot of data about the different players, so in other words, all the companies that are in one way or another, a publisher or an information provider, uh, uh, and, uh, and we serve our clients through a, a variety of services, including reports and data and analysis. And, uh, and sort of consulting type services. Um, the way we view the industry is helping, helping information companies grow their revenues, understand what's going on in the world, know where to move uh, in the future. Uh, and so our focus is quite a bit on the established companies, the, the big name publishers that you all recognize. And we do a lot of research on their markets. So what's going on with end users, what, are, what trends do we see among end users, how much time do they spend using information, how much money do they spend using it, things like that. Um, we also track the technologies that are going into the public, publishing industry uh, and try to keep our clients up to date on that stuff. And one of the reasons this, uh, this lot, of, whole lot of initiative is interesting to me is that it's we also have to keep our keep track of disruptive uh, forces out there in the marketplace. Who are the who are the disruptive entrants? What are the new business models that are coming along as a result of new technologies that are either threats or opportunities to a lot of the established players? Uh, so I thought I'd start by just taking sort of painting a picture of the legal information industry as as we know it. Um, and, and sort of what, what are some of the dynamics in recent years? What are some of the things I see going on in the future? Um, and just in terms of, of numbers, I wanted to first paint a little context of the entire industry. So uh, as I said, we track a lot of segments of the information industry. Uh, and the whole, the whole shebang is uh, $365 billion worth of that about 14 and a half billion is legal. So legal is actually a fairly small uh, segment of the overall information industry. Um, and, and our 365 billion doesn't, doesn't include some things like entertainment and um, you know, entertainment type content. It's, it's mostly business to business uh, publishers and sources. So in that context, legal is fairly small. The blue lines show the, the global revenues over the past few years and, and projected out to 2012. The, uh, the sad looking line in the middle is 2009, where uh, the, the industry lost 8.5% of its value um, during, the, during the current recession. Um, so uh, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of, uh, a lot, of, a lot going on in the industry because of the, the, global, the global recession. It has definitely affected the publishing industry. But also, a lot of that effect is a result of technology and, uh, 
and it's constant push and pressures on the industry. So if we zoom in a little more on just legal, uh, here's what it looks like. Uh, it's a little more flat. It's a little more stable than the overall industry. And if you, if you ran this 2007 uh, back to, say, 2002 or so, um, it's pretty flat. It's, it's a pretty boring industry in terms of fluctuations in, in revenues. It, it's, it's pretty stable. A lot of the <coughs> revenues in the industry are subscription-based, and that helps even out um, fluctuations in, in, in the economy. But even, even so, 2009 was a tough year for the legal information industry. For the first year since we've been tracking it, uh, it, it went negative. Um, and we're expecting it to, to slowly recover. Actually, I think this might be a little optimistic for 2010 at 2% growth. Um, but it'll eventually, I think, get back up to somewhere in the 5% range. Uh, if you extend this back, the, the growth rates were typically, <coughs> excuse me, typically in the sort of five to seven percent rate every year. Uh, so that's what that's the that's what we're talking about. The the, the legal, tax and regulatory publishers of the world generate uh, fourteen and a half billion dollars in, in revenue. How is that split up uh, among um, the various providers? Well, I, as you all know, there's. There's three big, really big, uh, legal publishers in the world. Thomson Reuters, Walters Kluwer, and Reed Elsevier, which owns LexisNexis. Um, and together, they account for 75% of those $14.5 billion in revenue. And I think what's fascinating about this is that aside from BNA here, Probably not, and, and a couple of associations, probably not a lot of those players are familiar to a lot of us. Uh, and that says a lot, that there's, there's sort of nobody left out there for them, for the big three to acquire that you might recognize. Uh, if you look at the, if you take away this chunk, it kind of looks like a Pac-Man going after everybody else. Uh, and that's, that's pretty much what's happened uh, you know, over, the, over the past several decades. Uh, those three players have acquired quite a bit of the legal information market through acquisitions, but also through organic growth. Um, it's not just just acquisitions. So that's a picture of the market share with the three big players. Here's the here's a little more specifics on on uh, how uh, how much revenue each of them has and how much uh, what the growth rates look like in 2009. <clears throat> it's a little bit tricky with growth rates. Um, because uh, the big three players report their revenues in three different currencies. Uh, and currency fluctuations just make comparisons uh, very difficult. Um, and it's not just that they earn all their money in Europe, for example. You have, you have LexisNexis, which earns a lot of money over here, reporting its revenues in, uh, in, uh, in uh, pounds, and then and then we're converting it back into dollars. So there's a lot of stuff going on there that makes it a little bit hard to compare growth rates company to company. The reason we convert everything to dollars is just to have one currency that we can say, okay, here's how big the whole industry is. But that, but if you wanted to compare company to company, it's a little more uh, useful to go back to their uh, native currencies and, and, and see what the uh, sort of growth in their native currency was. But anyway, having said that, and then also you see that there are some places that were more affected by currency growth than others. Um, the actual growth rates of these, sort of the rest of the top 10, were you know, fairly flat across the board. But if you're in Japan, that means your, your revenues went up in dollars. But if you're in Europe, it, it means the currency exchange rates means your revenues went down in dollars. So that's a little tricky. Um, and then the long tail of the industry is about 1.6 billion of all the companies, all the revenues of all the companies that are smaller than this top 10. Um, so that's uh, that's the that's the big picture. So of the of the um, of that of that 14 and a half billion dollars in revenue, I think one of the questions that's that's relevant to um, you know to this discussion is. Uh, if we're focused on, for the purposes of the law that, that, uh, today, 
uh, the U.S. Uh, and it's all about uh, surfacing and making available primary legal documents. Then one interesting question is, okay, how much of that $14.5 billion is, is private companies selling access to public documents? What's, what's the share of that money that's, that, that we as a society are spending with private companies, with commercial publishers, to get access to our, to our own data? Uh, and that's a really hard question, and I, and I, and I think uh, you'll, you'll see why. I mean, the, if, you, if you take the whole pie at, at 14 and a half billion, first thing you do, and that's pretty easy, you take out everything that's not US. So two, uh, about a third of the, of the, um, of the market is, is, is non-US, primarily Europe and Japan and a few other Asian countries. Um, that, that, that cuts it down a little bit. Um, you can also take out non-research products. Uh, as I'll get to in a minute, one of the things that the major publishers like Thompson and LexisNexis and Walter Schooler have done is move to other areas other than research and information. They, they sell software. They sell software to help you run your law firm. They sell uh, all kinds of non-research products. Uh, so that leaves about half of the $14.5 billion that's kind of research products. Uh, but you have to make another distinction, and that is what what share of that half is primary research, primary legal sources versus uh, secondary research. And so you know, as you know, publishers publish treatises, they publish articles, they publish journals, they publish all kinds of stuff that's editorial content that's not primary legal sources provided by public uh, public uh, public uh, bodies. Uh, there are lots of products that mix pure, uh, uh, you know, pure data from government sources with analytical tools or a layer of finding tools or a layer of metadata that's editorial provided. So I don't know where to draw the line, frankly. But if you say if you took it at about 50-50, if you said, let's say half of what uh, the the major providers provide is. Um, primary, it, 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 what, it, what they're selling is access to primary sources. It would be about three and a half billion dollars. But I'm willing to have an argument about where that percentage and where that lot line should be because I don't really know. I, I find it very hard to pick apart what exactly when you do a search on Westlaw or Nexus or uh, search some of Walter Schooler's online tax products. What, what share of the money you're spending is going to the documents versus going to the service, the service you're getting, the, the metadata, the ease of use, etc., the aggregation. So that's that's kind of a, a picture that's kind of intended as food for thought because I don't think it's a, a definitive answer. Uh, there's a there's a couple more things uh, that I wanted to just sort of take a step back and talk about in terms of the the, the question of where where the industry is going. In terms of the recent past, let's take a look at, and now from here on out, I'm kind of focusing on the big three, uh, Thompson and, and, uh, and that's the next to Walter Stewart. The, the recession has really hit the legal industry hard. For the first time, I think, uh, you, you really see a major retrenchment and uh, real difficulties uh, in uh, that industry. And even the you know the largest law firms have undergone rounds of layoffs. Maybe things are stabilizing, stabilizing a little bit now. But that law major law firm market is the biggest market for the big three players, uh, and that's that accounts for the dip uh, by and large. Um, those uh, best customers are under intense pressure uh, to cut costs, and corporate counsel, who are the people who hire those law firms are starting to turn the screws, are starting to become innovative themselves in how they, they're, they're calling the shots a little more on how they do business with major law firms. And that's affecting uh, the revenues that go into law firms and, that, and the money that's then available to, uh, to publishers. So that's one thing that's going on. 
Um, another thing that's going on kind of in the buyer marketplace, if you look at law libraries, particularly law firm libraries, uh, they are still functioning like libraries, libraries used to do. Um, for all the innovation that's gone on, I think the, the incredible growth in the, the big law in the sector of the, of the law firm industry has meant that law libraries in, in law firms have been kind of shielded from some of the same pressures that have um, affected corporate law libraries. And so I think law firm libraries are maybe five or ten years behind corporate libraries in their sort of transition to new ways of doing things. And, and uh, those new ways include a lot of a different approach to purchasing, a different approach to uh, the library being a separate entity versus having skilled information professionals out in the out in the organization uh, as part of a multi uh, um, uh, multi functional teams of, of, of researchers. So that law library market sector for these publishers is under a lot of pressure too. Um, there are two areas that have been pretty good for the for the major uh, law firms, or at least the areas where they tend to be looking for growth. Since the, since the core legal market here in the States is pretty well saturated, a lot of them are looking to international markets, and a lot of them are looking to practice-related software services. So if you take the international piece, Thompson just bought a Brazilian uh, publisher uh, this week. Uh, there's a lot of activity going on in China and India are uh, major areas for development for all three of these publishers. Um, so that's one area, one part of the world where they're seeing better growth than they're getting out of the domestic market. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, they're also producing more and more uh, software and service type offerings. Uh, so in addition to buying your research from the West, you could buy work workflow software, you could buy case management systems. You can buy practice management. You can even buy consultants, consultancy services from from Hildebrand. Uh, you can you can help. You can you can use fine law to market your firm. You can uh, and and then they also serve, of course, the educational sector, not just law schools, but also continuing education. Um, so the it's not your father's Westlaw Lexis Nexus anymore. They've infiltrated infiltrated their way into market sectors that are different from just research or, or product sectors, I should say. Uh, so they're offering a wider range of services, but still primarily focused on that law firm market. They, if you think about it, I mean, if you talk to people from, I, I worked at, Tom's, at West in the 1980s, and I talked to people who work there now, and it's a completely different mindset. They were a publisher in 1985, Today they're a you know they have a professional services and software mindset. Uh, so what's that's kind of the recent past. Now let's look forward. What's going on? Where I think there's a couple themes swirling around um, the, the commercial publishers uh, that are interrelated, uh, and I think they're going to mean a lot of change for the legal services industry, and that's going to mean change for the for the information industry as well. Uh, the first is what we're talking about today, open access. Um, expectations among users and buyers are changing very fast. They expect everything to be open, uh, timely, free. Uh, the, the issue of cost, which has been alluded to several times here, is that uh, making uh, access to primary legal documents cheaper will not only benefit the newbies, the fast cases of the world, but also the it'll benefit Thompson and, and LexisNexis if they want to use that new, newly available content for new products. Um, the big distinction here is I think we're moving to a conception of open access from it's a, that it's about data, not documents. It's not about uh, courts or legislatures publishing documents and, and that's called open access. It's about them making that data available freely for other people to use, to build upon, to add to, to manipulate, to combine with other sources. Uh, so I think that's that's one big front of uh, activity that, that's affecting the, the commercial industry as well. Uh, the next 
sort of big trend is I think the, 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 the availability of technology in general is leveling the playing field between the big law firms and the small ones and the solo players. Um, if you're a small, if you're a two-man uh, law firm, you have lots of tools today that you didn't have 10 years ago. You can do your research on fast kids or case maker. You can use rocket matter to set up your whole firm's infrastructure. Uh, you can blog, you can use, use social media to market yourself. Uh, if you want to make cheap uh, sort of routine services available to clients, you can use uh, a, docu a, a service like Direct Law, which kind of makes, helps you build a, a virtual law firm. So there's lots of things in motion that are making it easier for the small firms to do business. Uh, and it's kind of an open question of will the big players be interested in that market or not? And I, so far, to me, it looks like not that much. Uh, I think there's lots of, like, lots of small competitors that are coming into that space that are um, grabbing a lot of the, the share of, 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 that, of that sector of the legal the services industry. Uh, the other of the four big things that's sort of swirling around out there is, uh, I guess you can call it in general, peer-to-peer -peer collaboration or uh, socialization of legal commentary or just like social media. Um, there are ways in which lawyers are sharing information with each other that in, in many ways bypass the, re the, the need for published information. Uh, they're, they're helping each other find document information they need. They're helping each other interpret the information they need. And it's all being done in a social way, in a, in a free way. And so some of the things that publishers used to do um, are, 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 I won't say unnecessary, but are diminishing in importance. One, one interesting thing, I think, in terms of what's hot in terms of content is, <coughs> is that more and more legal information products focusing on the practical aspects of the practice of law. Not just the what, you know, what did the court decide? What does the statute say? But the how of it. Uh, I, need to, I need to do this filing next week. What do I need to do to do the filing? What are the steps? And uh, companies like Practical Law Company is a good example of somebody who's uh, coming into a the marketplace and, and constructing kind of a whole new kind of information product that's not just about uh, finding the primary law, but actually helping lawyers walk through the process, the how of practicing law. <coughs> and of course, the idea of, the idea of open um, access to legal content really plays well into that increased use of social media and collaboration among, among lawyers. Um, so there again, I mean, these trends are kind of interrelated. And then finally, the, the piece of this that I think is really most interesting in the long term is whether uh, whether there will be a sustainable, you know, and growing market for consumer level uh, legal information. And I think a lot of what we talk about here is, you know, getting the average citizen in touch with the content, the legal content that they need from their, from their government. Um, but it can go a lot of directions because, you know, a lot, let's face it, a lot of legal content isn't all that useful to a, an ordinary consumer. Uh, you know, uh, uh, so sure, you can search cases on Google uh, Scholar. What, what does that do, do for me as a consumer? Uh, it, it requires levels of interpretation. And, you know, it doesn't answer any direct questions. But stuff like building permits, liquor licenses, other more practical things that we don't, that, that sort of fall into the sort of more broader definition of, of what's legal information, are going to be a really hot area for, you know, for innovation once, once they're set free. Uh, if, if companies can come in and start using some of that kind of data, mashing it up with other data, building applications on top of it, that's, there you got something. Um, and, it, and then the, I see sort of a spectrum also from consumers to there's a lot of non-lawyers in the corporate market that need access to legal information. So law for non-lawyers. Uh, I think that's going to be another area sort of a little bit over from the consumer market where 
they need uh, quite technical information, maybe they need the building permits or they need the filings from various regulatory agencies, that kind of thing. So I think this sort of non-lawyer market is, is the big unknown, but it's also the big uh, opportunity, I think, for this whole movement. Uh, and I think that's what's, um, uh, that's what they're moving. So, uh, just to go back and sum things up, I've heard, Carl, I've heard you talk about three big values, justice, democracy, and innovation, all of which this open access movement is serving. And I think the really interesting one is the innovation, because without the innovation, the justice and the democracy is not going to happen. I mean, as, as we've been hearing these horror stories of, you know, the, the current state of where public information is, uh, we really need to work on the technical sides of things before the democracy and the justice can start to happen. But I don't think people, people tend to have this paradigm of, you know, set legal information free. That means, oh, we're going to have a Westlaw and Lexus, but it's going to be free. I don't think that's really where things are going. I think the, the, the real end game is finding new markets for the information, as I said, with, with consumers, with small business people, with solo practitioner uh, players and, and, and people like that. Those are new markets that are very poorly served by the legal services industry today and that could really benefit from some of the innovation that, that we're talking about here. So I think the, the big publishers are going to continue to focus on their, their core market, which is big law firms, corporate counsel, they're going to do fine. Um, they're going to have to adjust, but they're going to do fine. Uh, the open access movement is going to create or, or help create uh, a lot of new uh, latent markets. And then what happens with this is that as all this stuff gets infiltrated into these consumer markets and, and lawyers at big law firms start seeing people using services and tools that are cheap and free and fun, they're going to start to ask, why can't I have that? And some of the big uh, products and services and price points uh, of the big publishers are, are going to be under continued pressure through this whole period because uh, of the way the, the, the innovative new products are, are going to make life easier for a lot of people. And everybody's going to want to have a piece of that. So that's about what I had to say. Um, I hope it was useful. Any questions? John Mayer from Calvi. Um, so it would seem to me that the strategy of the big three would be to let the marketplace innovate, you know, the small firm, and then uh, buy some of these small guys up. Is that is that a pattern from them buying like all the you know or already buying all the small publishers in the consolidation? Why would wouldn't consolidation just happen in that innovation market as well? I wouldn't bet on, I wouldn't bet against that happening. But on the other hand, I mean the the, the big three have you know they they always face strategic choices about different markets and if if uh, you know if the consumer market really is something where they see a lot of this coming to fruit and some smaller companies start start making a lot of money there sure that, that that's a that's a possible choice but it's also an entailed a choice to go into consumer markets in a bigger way than they already are The open source movement, from your perspective, because you mentioned that, that you also try to spot disruptive forces in the market, it, is the open source movement of getting information available and creating applications for it seen as the major disruptive force or not, and if, whether yes, positive or negative, and for whom? I think it is very much a disruptive force. Um, it's again, if you look across the whole information industry, just by analogy, I mean, it's 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 caused a lot of disruption for the scientific publishing industry, for example, the whole uh, open, access, open source, open access to, to scientific publishing has caused a lot of change there. So yeah, certainly I think it's going to bring price pressures and, and, and all kinds of um, trouble. I th I, there's, there's some sectors that are more troubled by other outside forces than others. I mean, the news industry is the basket case of the industry, um, but it's not so much open access as much as it's a flavor of open access and, and it was sort of the, the, the openness and freeness of, of uh, news content so far. Yeah, I had a question. Um, so the seven billion dollars in the primary, secondary access to U.S. materials, right? You know, not trying to split it up and yeah. what the primary is. How much do governments, federal and state governments, spend 
And how much do our law schools spend? Do you have any idea? I don't have a good number off the top of my head, but it's it's, uh, it's the vast majority of it is, is still uh, private and very long. Just have for one more question, and then we're going to break for lunch. Well, we have librarians here that could tell you how much they spend. <laughs> We have the ADA takeoff, you're right. I think it varies from $7 million down to a million and less. So a million, a million right times 200 law schools? Oh, what? A million times 200 law schools? Yeah, except for the big ones who spend more. Um, but some spend a lot less, too. Um, I don't know. Ballpark? Is that oh, right? right? Yeah. So 200, 200 million, that's. Absolutely. That's not a lot of money. Yeah. Okay. Let's say. Let's say. Let's say. Let's say, let's say, let's say yeah. I don't, yeah. Let's say it's five hundred million. I mean, it's it's that's you know that's the size of the or something. Sorry. Most of that's for print. And a lot. Yeah. And a lot of it's for print too. And well, there's academic discount too. Yeah. Difference. Yeah. Carl, that's we have time for more answer. questions. Uh, lunch is on its way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> or we could simply break for bathrooms. But if there's questions, let's take advantage of David being here. This is actually a rare opportunity. Normally, this costs a lot of money. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a question about government as a competitor in, in mostly in publications. It looks like sometimes I've read some articles where business interests seem to be saying, just give us the raw data like data.gov. Don't try to put up any websites or information. Don't do any value added sites like the Department of Energy wanted to do. Just put that data out. We'll take care of it. And, and I'm very suspicious of that kind of approach. Well, I think it, I think it's one area where maybe the interests of you know a lot of people in this room and the interests of, of the big commercial publishers are are together. Actually, I mean everybody wants low costs, uh, and and if uh, you know if if commercial or non-governmental uh, entities are, are able to get this stuff for free and are able to do better, you know, as, as the example we just heard, you know, can put up a better website than the Washington. Court can do by itself. Let's have at it. There's been a whole pattern that ALA has documented this where publications that were publicly available for decades, even valuable ones, suddenly became private. Uh, natural cancer, there's some, there's several, there's a whole bunch, a full list of them that the government used to provide for free and peer reviewed and all the whole shot. And all of a sudden, pressure comes from somewhere and they get turned into private publications that are very expensive. Yeah. So that's the, that's the other side where you don't see a common interest. It, well, it is the other side, except that if, 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 if this movement plays out the way everybody would want it to, I think you know, you'd, you'd have the access to the bulk data would be, would, would be free uh, or very in, inexpensive. And so if, uh, if, if, if you try to take that data and turn it into an expensive journal, somebody else could maybe take the same data and, and do something for free or cheap. Yeah, hopefully. Hopefully. Yeah, in your talk, are you suggesting at some level that the J D Super and the legal arms might be a more logical partner for this kind of activity? Among the or for the, for the open access to to law that kind of thing? Uh, I think they're I think they're part of the whole spectrum of, of activity. I think you know take a, take J D Super for example, is a it's a it's another flavor, in a way, of, of open access. It's not opening up government information. It's opening up, you know, the private practitioner's information for different purposes. Uh, but it's, it's, you know, it's feeding the whole sense that uh, of, of openness and access. It's also, it also ties into the consumer market because a lot of those products are are designed to help lawyers market. It. It's not, you know, their only motive is not just enlighten the world. They're trying to get people to see their work product and attract customers. Um, so there's a lot of this stuff that kind of this openness that crosses between you know what's what's non-governmental and what's private sector. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not just about open up, opening up government. Okay. Thanks.